Let's lift our voices. It's great to come together as a congregation this morning and praise our great God together. Let's sing out to him. He's coming on the clouds. Come on, raise your voice. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Yes, they will. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his grace. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? And our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. The lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. But his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. That's the God we sing out to this morning. The God that every knee will bow to in heaven and on earth. Let's open our hearts to him as we sing. Come on, raise your voice. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Yes, he is. He's come to save. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord? Omnipotence, who can stop the Lord? We'll sing. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord? Come on, let's sing it again over our lives. Who can? Stop the Lord, all oh, your ways are perfect. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, Who can stop the Lord? We sing our God, and our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He is roaring power in fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him and our God is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee Bow before him. Amen. Let's bow our heads together. Jesus, we choose to bow. We choose to submit ourselves to you, Lord. We choose um, to crown you as king, which you righteously and you rightly are, Lord. There's none above you. Uh, there's none even beside you, Lord. It is a single focus to you. And I pray that this uh, morning of, of praise and worship and this morning of hearing your word would be a morning of uh, crowning you with our lives and our hearts and our affections. Um, God.
God, we thank you that uh, amongst a, a world that is changing and a world that is shifting and a world that is um, uh, unpredictable, that you are our foundation. And as we sing about that right now, Lord, I pray um, that you would just open our eyes uh, to how you have been our foundation throughout our whole life, how you have been um, integral in our day-to-day, -day, how you have pushed us to praise you um, because you deserve it, Lord. Open our eyes to your goodness as we sing. Let's sing our hope is built. Come on, let's sing. My hope is built on nothing less, only his blood, than Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust, I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Yes, we do. Let's sing it again nice and loud. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less. Holy Jesus. In Jesus' blood in righteousness. Why did I trust the sweetest friend? shall come
songs to rise to you. When temptation comes by, and when I cannot stand up for you, oh Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Yes, you are, Lord. Sing so, teach. So teach my songs to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand or fall on you, oh Jesus, you're my hope and stay. You're a firm foundation in Christ, Christ alone. Again, I hear the Savior.
Jesus paid it all and all to him I am. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it away. Single praise. Sing to him. pray. Jesus, it is out of your great goodness that you would give us a story of redemption. It's out of your love, Lord, that you would offer peace with God. Thank you, Lord, um, just for that reminder this morning that every knee will bow and we choose to bow to you now and place you as righteous king over our hearts, Lord, over our lives, over our affections. first verse, it just says, find in me your all in all. And uh, it's so true, Lord. I pray that we would find everything in you. It's all there. It's all being offered. Uh, may everything pale in comparison to what we find in you, Lord. Do work in our hearts this morning. We'll give you the glory. May this in your name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Hey, before you take a seat, Wish somebody a late Merry Christmas, early Happy New Year. Let's check in on each other. Say hi. Well, good morning, Crossroads. Oh, come on. Come on. Good morning, Crossroads. There we go. There we go. Well, I hope you've had a, uh, a Merry Christmas. I hope you were able to take time to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and consider all that that birth and his life and death accomplished for us. Uh, this morning, I want to start with a bit of a personal announcement. Uh, in the last few months, uh, God has been working in my life and in and, and Lynn's life as well, and uh, turning our hearts toward a ministry here at the church 
that, um, that we hadn't really been much involved with before. Uh, our church has a college ministry, a ministry for college-age kids. It's called the Oxford Fellowship, and it gets its name, Oxford Fellowship, because three years ago, two couples from the church started it at a home on Oxford Lane over in Circle J Ranch. And uh, they, through the last three years, have just ministered to the college-age students here of our church and, and their friends and others. And as happens in the life of young couples, the season of life changed for them. And so they were looking over the last few months to pass off the ministry to someone else. Well, uh, I had the opportunity this summer to speak in the Oxford Fellowship twice, and both times I went home to my wife and I said, that is such an awesome ministry. Uh, just, I, I mean, we as a church talk about college kids walking away from the Lord, so what a great place to give a sense of community together, to dig into God's word together, to share the gospel together, and as I prayed about it, uh, the church leadership has given me the opportunity to lead that ministry. And so uh, beginning here next Sunday night, we'll kick off 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock right upstairs back here for all college age individuals. We're going to look into the Word of God together, eat some food together, and uh, just see what God might do in our lives. So if you are in that age group, we'd love to have you there. If you uh, have friends or family in that age group, please encourage them to be there. Uh, I'm not leaving next gen. I'm still working in next gen as well. And uh, God's doing some great things there also. But just excited uh, for this new season of change in my life and my wife serving along alongside me in that. But I'm not the only one who's about to step into a time of change because in three days, we step into a new year. And I don't know if you thought about this yet. It's not just a new year. We're stepping into the 20s. Okay, and for me as a former history teacher, I'm like, wow, the 20s. Doesn't seem like that long ago that we were in the 20s. And if you, uh, if you were around for Y2K, you're like, how did we already get to the 20s? But the, the new year, and even more so a new decade, is a good time to reflect on our lives, to make a little self-evaluation and, and look into our lives and see where by God's grace we've been doing well and God has been working and, and changing us and where we still struggle or where we have areas that we need to focus on changing here in the coming year. Years ago when I was a junior high teacher, I started off the new year with my students. I said, take five minutes and just jot down on a piece of paper three to five things that maybe you could work on changing this year in your life. And so most of the students, you could see them thinking and they would jot down something. And I noticed one young lady hadn't written down anything. And so I kind of walked around the classroom and I made my way over to her desk and I looked down at her paper and the only thing on it was her name. And I remember she looked up at me at that moment and she said, but Mr. Kistler, what if there's nothing in your life you need to change? Yeah, <laughs> we laugh at that because we know it's not the case. None of us are perfect. None of us have arrived yet. And so for all of us, there's something that could be changed in our life. And this morning, I want to look with you at a passage in the Bible that talks about change. It's Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Turn with me there in your Bibles. Hebrews is probably the least understood book in the New Testament after Revelation. It's hard to understand the book of Hebrews. If you've ever opened it up and studied it for your devotions, you've quickly realized that unless you're willing to give it a good amount of time and attention, it's difficult to understand. And the reason for that difficulty is that it wasn't written to us. It wasn't written to modern 21st century Americans. The people that the book of Hebrews was written to are very different from us. They're, they're separated not only by 2,000 years of world history, but culturally they were very different from us, and religiously, even more so, they were different from us. The book of Hebrews was written to the... He Hebrews, okay? It's there in the title. It was written to the New Testament Jews, the people who were born right around the time that Jesus Christ, our Savior, was born. I want you to think about these people for a moment because the New Testament doesn't talk about them that much. When you study the New Testament, you, you look at the book of Acts and the story of the church growing, and what happens in the book of Acts? We see people getting saved. We see the apostles doing this great work, but then the focus turns to Paul. 
and Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. And soon we're learning about all of these cities that he's visiting, the churches that are being started, and then really most of the New Testament after that is letters written to those groups of believers. But what about those Jewish people who live in or around the land of Israel, who grew up going to temple, just like Jesus did, who grew up giving animal sacrifices, just like Jesus' family would have done, okay? who grew up working with priests and seeing the high priest and all of those things, what happened to them? Because here they are in the land of Israel, they believed on Jesus Christ, some of them, and followed after him, but many of them are now probably wondering, well, do we still keep going to the temple? Do, do we still keep making sacrifices? And so the first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews, the author, and we don't know exactly who it was, but someone with a deep understanding of the Jewish heritage, the author is writing to all of those Jewish people who have become believers, and he's talking about how Jesus is better than the Old Testament system, how Jesus is superior to angels, and Jesus is superior to the patriarchs, and the sacrifices, and the priesthood, and all of those things. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, the author author says, okay, okay, okay. Because Jesus is superior to all of these things, how does that truth change our lives? And so this morning, I want to look with you at what the author said to the Hebrew people about how Jesus ought to change their life. And I want us to consider for a few minutes how those same truths affect our own lives. So Hebrews chapter 10, we'll start in verse number 19. It says this, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, and I'll stop right there. Look at that word since. He uses it twice. The author uses it twice in these verses. He's going to lay a foundation here. Because Jesus Christ has done these things, it ought to affect our life in these ways. What things did Jesus do? Verse 19, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Do you ever read your Bible and just skip over parts? You're like, oh, I'm sure that says something nice, but like, I want something I can walk away with. I want application. I want something meaningful. And we, we skip these little phrases and we go, I'm sure that's important, but okay, I'm going to move on. This is one of those little phrases because we can skip right by this without understanding the massive context that's here in these, this verse. You see, when the Jewish people read this, that, that short little phrase would have been absolutely shocking to them. Why so? Well, what does the holy places mean? Since we have confidence to enter the holy places, well, what are the holy places? Well, for a Jewish person, that would have been abundantly clear. There was one holy place in the land of Israel, and even now, still today, 2,000 years later, this place is sacred. It is revered by the Jewish people, and that is the temple. Okay? For the Jewish people, when they looked at the temple, it wasn't simply this nice, ornate, beautifully designed building. It's where God lived, where God dwelled with his people here on earth. See, the temple had three parts, and each part was more sacred than the last. The outer part, the outside of the temple, was called the outer court. And only Jewish people could enter the outer court. In fact, in the time of Jesus, there were signs posted on the edge that if a Gentile walked into the outer court, he would just be killed. It's like, hey, we're telling you now, if you come in here, you die. They, they were very serious about that. That place in their minds was only for the people of God. And so the outer court of the temple was where you would go to sacrifice animals to, to get a cleansing from your sin. But then you stepped into the temple itself, okay, the building, a long rectangular building. It had two rooms, a, a front room that you would walk into and a back room. The front room that you stepped into was called the holy place, and that had an even greater restriction on it. Uh, most Jewish people could not step into the temple itself. To walk into the holy place, you had to be a priest, and even as a priest, you were on a certain schedule of when you were allowed to go in there. It was that revered. 
So you would walk into the holy place and along the side, along the walls, were golden candlesticks lit to represent the light that God is to the world, to his people. Along the side was a table, the table of showbread. And there was bread on that table that the priest could participate in or partake of on a scheduled basis. And at, at that time, in the Bible times, when you had food with someone, that was a serious thing. That meant that there was a relationship there, a unity there. That symbolized God's unity with his people. In the back of the room, there was another altar. It wasn't for sacrificing animals. It was for incense. So there was this sweet smell, the sweet aroma that would fill the temple. But in the very back, behind the altar of incense, was the final room. It was called the most holy place, or some translations call it the holy place of holies. And it was absolutely sacred in the minds of the Jewish people because in that place was where God dwelled with his people. In the Old Testament, when God would come down on the temple, it was the most holy place where he resided. And so, man, not just anyone could go in, in the outer courtyard, only the priests could go into that holy place. Only one person could walk into the most holy place, the holy of holies, and that was the high priest. And he could only go in there one day a year, the Day of Atonement. And when he went in there, he had to go through this elaborate process, this cleansing process, before he could step into the presence of God. And so on the Day of Atonement, that one day of a year, he would physically wash himself and make sure he was totally physically clean. And then he would get dressed in the priestly garments and then he would make a sacrifice for his own sin. So he was spiritually clean before the Lord. And then, and I, I think this is probably the most serious part, the part that would make me stop for a moment if I was the high priest, then they tied a rope to his ankle. Now that wasn't part of the outfit, that wasn't a fashion statement, okay? That was very practical. Because if he, the high priest, walked into the most holy place, into the presence of God Almighty, and he was not clean, he was not right before the Lord. What happens if God strikes him dead? How do you get him out? Because you're not allowed in there. So they, they would literally tie a rope to the high priest's ankle just in case, like, if he messes up and God takes him down, we can at least get the body back out of there, okay? This was a serious thing to come into the presence of Almighty God. So think of that as your context and read this verse. Brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy places. What? For the entire life of the Jews who would have read this, they would have been like, we have no confidence to go into the holy places. We're not allowed in the holy places. Only the high priest in only one day a year is he allowed in the holy place. But now it's saying, brothers... We have confidence to step into the presence of Almighty God. Folks, what, what changed? Hey, well, why for the thousand, the 1,500 years before the coming of Christ from Mount Sinai on, why could only the high priest go into there? And now the author of Hebrews is saying, no, we can step into the presence of Almighty God. Look at the end of that passage. By the blood of Jesus. What changed? Jesus Christ changed everything. You see, no longer were these people purified symbolically by offering up a, a, a lamb or a goat or, or an ox. Now they had been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now again, again think about the Jewish culture with me. When, when we sin, what do we do afterwards? Well, we, we confess our sin to the Lord. We say, Lord, I, I'm so sorry. I, I shouldn't have said that to my wife. I shouldn't have treated my kids that way. I've been lazy this week at work. I, I know that's not right. And we know the Lord forgives us of our sin. But for the Jews in the Old Testament time, man, when they sinned, oh boy, I gotta go offer an animal sacrifice. Hey, I gotta make a journey to Jerusalem and either bring my purest lamb or if, if you're wealthy, an ox with me or I buy one there at the temple, and I, I bring that animal into the temple. And I, I would symbolically put my hand on that animal's head, and, and my sin would pass again, symbolically, my sin would pass from me, the guilty party, onto this innocent animal that did nothing wrong. Hey, that, that, 
that would cause you to pause for a moment. And then, and I, I don't want to be graphic here, but then you as the sinner, you as the wrongdoer, would then take that animal's life. And you think, that, that's horrible, that's awful. It, it was meant to be horrible because our sin is horrible. It was meant to cause the Jewish people to go, oh, oh my goodness, my sin, what I've done wrong is so serious in God's sight that an innocent animal has to die for me to get right with God again. But folks, did the blood of sheep or you know, whatever this animal happened to be at the time, did it provide actual cleansing? No, look back a couple verses in chapter 10 with me to verse number four. It says this, Hebrews 10, four. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Okay, God didn't look at that and go, oh, there's a dead lamb, now everything's okay. Now everything's fine, you've sacrificed the lamb, that was worthy of your sin toward me. No, 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 no. It was just symbolic, it was saying, I'm gonna obey in faith and obedience and sacrifice this animal knowing that someday a Messiah will come and his sacrifice will really, will actually cleanse me from all of my sin. Look down a couple more verses at Hebrews 10, verses 11 and 12. It says this, and every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. Look, you sin, you have to offer the animal as a sacrifice. You go home, you yell at your wife, oh man. All right, son, go grab me another sheep. I gotta go back. Hey, you had to do this over and over again because your sin continued and it needed to be atoned for. So what does it say? The same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But, verse 12, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. So what changed, folks? Why, do we, why are we able to enter into the throne room of God? Why are we able to step up to the mercy seat? It's because if you are a believer, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you from all your sin. There's nothing between you and God now. There's no sin that, that would separate that relationship with God. You have been cleansed. So for these Jews, their whole life, they're on the outside of the temple looking in. They're wondering, hey, I wonder what it looks like inside there. I wonder what it's like to step into the presence of God. Now, because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we have access to God the Father. Folks, that ought to change things. And so the author of Hebrews, look back at what it says in verse number 19. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, since we now have access to God, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us, and here's where the change comes in. And the author is gonna give three areas of change for those Hebrews and three areas that I would say, I, I, I know I can change in my own life, and probably all of us can change in some ways in our own life. Number one, since Christ died for us, let us draw near to God. The first, let us. Let us draw near to God. Look at verse 22. Because he's done all that, because of his work, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Folks, we can have a close, meaningful relationship with deity. Now, if you've been in church for any amount of time, that thought's like, yeah, I know, that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, that, that can blow right by us, like, duh, it doesn't really matter. No, that changes everything. You can talk to God. When I call out to the Lord, me, just little Ken Gisler, one of six, what, six billion people or so, people on the planet, when I call out to God, he goes, yes, Ken? He hears me. He knows me. 
He knows my fears. He knows my hopes. He knows my dreams. He knows my struggles. And not only does he know me, he cares about me, me personally. And not just me, but each of you who have been saved by his grace. We're no longer on the outside. The way has been open for us. And as it says in the Gospels, the day that Jesus Christ died, the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two. The way is open, so let's step into it. What boggles my mind in my own life is that I have the opportunity to draw near to God but so often I draw near to so many other things. We as humans aren't bad at drawing near. In fact, we're pretty good at drawing near. We just draw near to a lot of other stuff. We draw near to uh, movies and entertainment. We draw near to social media. We draw near to money. We draw near to being known by others. We draw near to friends and family, and that's not even a bad thing. But the problem is God gets pushed down that list. And God's saying, because of what Jesus Christ did, you draw near to your Lord. Draw near to God and know his love. Draw near to him and find his comfort. Draw near to thank him for what he's done. Hey, if you got a, a free half hour, even a free 15 minutes, if you really want to do it well, a free hour this week, just get alone by yourself and start thanking God for things. And you're like, an hour, really? Oh yeah, once you get rolling, man, <laughs> there is so much to thank God for. And just come to his presence and say, Lord, man, you are so good. Thank you for, boom, 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 boom. And I promise you, at the end of that hour, you will have a different look at your life. You will see your life, problems and all, in the sight of God's goodness and love. Or, or take some time this week and, and not only thank God, just adore him. Worship him for who he is. Start thinking about his character and his aspects and everything about him. And again, when you step away from a time drawing near to God in that, you're like, wow, God is amazing. And we know that. I know we know that up here. But the author says, Let, let's do it here in our hearts. Let's draw close to him. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I've tried. I, I've tried to draw close to God. I've tried to have a relationship with him. And when I pray, it's like he's not even there. He's not even answering. He, it's like he doesn't even care. And there's probably some of you here this morning who feel that way. And it, it could be one of three things. One, it could just be a season in your life, a time of, of struggle. Okay, that happens. And the Lord sometimes allows that to make the time when we do draw near to him even sweeter. But secondly, maybe it's because you you don't have access. Maybe it's because you really can't draw near to him. Look at how that verse goes on. It says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know what, folks? You still have to be clean to draw near to God. That hasn't changed. That requirement hasn't changed. Just like for the, the high priest there in the Old Testament, this whole cleansing ritual that would take place before they stepped into the Holy of Holies, we have to be clean before we step into the presence of a holy God. The difference for us is that if you're a believer, Christ has done that. He has cleansed you. That's what gives you access. But if you've never accepted Christ, if you've never believed in him to forgive your sin, you're still dirty. You don't have access. This is something that's given to God's children. If you're not one of God's children, if you're in rebellion to him, then you can't do that until something changes. But maybe you're here this morning and you're like, Pastor Ken, I, I know I'm a Christian. I, I, I have had times of sweet access with God. I have had times where, when I have felt close to him and I've been able to draw near to him and be in relationship with him. But lately, just... I don't know, something's come between us. Well, look at the verse again. Let us draw near with a true heart, a sincere heart, an undivided heart. Have you ever had a divided heart? 
For me, it happens when someone says Rattlers or Stonefire. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, man, they're both good. You got the breadsticks, but you got the rolls. I, I mean, like you genuinely want both things, but you can only choose one. That happens to us sometimes with God, doesn't it? An idol comes into our life. And we want both things. We, we want the Lord and we, we love the Lord and we still want him, but there's this thing that's pulling our heart in another direction. And if we have a divided heart, if we don't have a true heart, that's gonna cause a, a break in the relationship. Think about the prodigal son. Did the dad leave the prodigal son? No, the son left him. The son went after other things. The son went, ah, kind of my heart is here right now. I want these things. And it wasn't until the pain and the hurt and the scars came in his life that he went, oh man, I'm done with those things. I want to go back to my dad. That's how it is with us and God. God doesn't leave us. We leave him and go after other things. Sometimes I, I get home after being here at church and we have five kids at home. I love coming home, usually. I usually love coming home because uh, our three youngest are young enough that when I open the door, it's like, daddy's home. And if it's a really good day, they'll like run and give me a hug. And I'm like, yes, I love being a dad. But then there are other days I get home and I see, you know, usually it's my, my four-year-old son like shrinking into the couch. Or if it's really bad, he's not there at all because he's back in his room until I get home. And what's happened? Well, what's happened is while I was away, he did something that broke that relationship. I still love him and I'm still there for him, but we got to get that thing right before he and I can have that same fellowship and beautiful relationship again. So maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, I, I do love God. I care about God. I know I'm a believer, but I just, I haven't been able to connect with him. Maybe there's an idol of the heart that's keeping you. I would plead with you this morning as we come to a new year, don't carry that into the new year. Don't, don't carry that into the new decade. And, and let's be honest, maybe there's idols that have hung around for a decade. To put those things out and say, Lord, all I want is you. All I want is you. I want to be in a relationship with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to talk to you. I want to hear from you. I want to think about you. Let us draw near to God. Here's the second thing. Since Christ died for us, let us cling to his promises. Let us cling to his promises. Look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You see, the Hebrews, these New Testament Jewish Christians had made a confession, a, a verbal confession. They had chosen Christ. And at that time, that was a very unpopular thing to do. People got killed for doing that. Hey, they killed Christ, they killed many of his apostles. Now for these people to say, I'm leaving the Old Testament practices behind and following Jesus Christ, that was a big deal. And what happens in their life? Just like it happens in our life, there's struggles, there's questions, there's doubts, there's, there's fears. And so what does the author say? Because of what Jesus Christ did, because he came, because he died, because his blood cleansed us, Hold on to his promises. Why? Look at the end. For he who promised is faithful. And for the Jewish people reading that, they would look back to their Old Testament, to Genesis chapter 3, where right after the sin of Adam and Eve, God said, hey, I'm going to send someone to fix this. You sinned, you messed up, but because I love you, I will send a redeemer. I will send a messiah. They would think back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, their, their great forefathers, and they would remember the promise to Abraham that through his line, through the Jewish people, all the people of the world would be blessed. That's Jesus. They would remember the words of the prophets who would say, hey, in the city of Bethlehem, a virgin will be with child. They'll say from the line of David, a savior will come. And they would look at that to Jesus and see in Jesus that God was faithful. God kept his promise. Down through thousands of years of human history, God kept his promise. And if God kept his promise then, guess what? He's gonna continue to keep his promises. 
What do we do in our lives when we're asked to trust someone? Well, we evaluate their past, right? Uh, you're told by a coworker, hey, I'm gonna have it done, don't worry about it. And we're like, well, yeah, the last two times you said you were gonna have it done, you didn't have it done, okay? Or we look at someone, hey, I'll be there. And guess what, they're there. You go, okay, I, I can trust you. You keep your promises. Well, what about the word of God? He says, cling to the promises of God. Why? Because God keeps his promises. But look at the two words he uses there in English, hold fast. Do we have uh, any Navy veterans here this morning? Any Navy veterans? Yeah, okay, I see a couple hands. Awesome, awesome, awesome. The Navy likes this term, hold fast, and it has been passed down for centuries in the Navy. Because years ago, when the Navy had old wooden sailing ships, this was a really big deal. Think about those ships. You've seen them in movies or on TV or in pictures. These massive ships with huge sails, and they had these masts, these big wooden spars that would go up to 200 feet in the air, okay? Think of the ceiling here and then double that. And what does it take to control those, those huge sails? Well, it takes the ropes. And so these poor sailors would have to climb up the rigging and go out on the spars that held up the sails and either, either let the sails out or bring them in. I'm sure there's like technical terms for all of that stuff. But you're climbing this rope and you're now as high as our ceiling here. And as the ship is rocking back and forth, one little slip and bam, you're, you're dead or, or splash, you're dead. Think about it in a storm. Okay, I was reading a book recently about this time period, and it was talking about, you know, the guys on the deck, they're swaying back and forth like this. What about the guys who are 100 feet up? They're swaying, you know, yards back and forth, and they're over the deck, they're over water, they're over the deck, they're over water. And what was said at that time was, hold fast. When they held fast, it wasn't like, it was like, okay, they're wrapping their arms through the rigging, they're holding on, they're wrapping their legs around it. They are not letting go because to let go meant death. Let us hold fast to the promises of God. Folks, I don't know what's going on in every life here this morning. I know some things. I know our family had... So our families here at the church had some relatives who passed away just this week. I know there are folks who got tough announcements just in the last few days about medical things. And what I want to say to you this morning is, hold fast. Trust the promises of God. He has never let us down. He has never failed us. He has never failed to deliver Cling to those promises because God was faithful with Jesus Christ. He will be faithful in your life as well. Here's the last one. Since Christ died for us, let us draw near. Since Christ died for us, let us cling to his promises. Since Christ died for us, let us live out love and good works. Let us live out love and good works. You see, the first two things that we're asked to do, those are mostly internal things. They start with a heart, and there are actions attached to them, but they're mostly heart issues. And if the heart issue is right, it, it transforms us outwardly. But the third one is blatantly an external action. The third one is get up off the couch. The third one is walk out your front door and go do acts of love and good works toward people. Because Jesus Christ died for us, it shouldn't just result in an inward change. There should be an outward change as well. Look at the words that are used there. Let us consider, verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That term stir up is a really interesting word. Most of the time when that's translated into English from the Greek, it's translated annoy. Annoy. Okay, now, if you have a sibling, you are well aware of what that term means, annoy. Uh, I watch it with our kids at home, our three little ones and then the two older ones. Oh, the little ones will say, hey, will you play with me? 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 And the first few times, it's like, no, 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 go away. I don't like you. You bug me. No, no. Will you play with me? Okay, fine. If you will stop asking, I will play with you for a few minutes. What took place there? They stirred up and got a result from the action. That word stir up means to irritate 
into good works. Now, I want to compliment someone right now. He's not here, which is why I'm doing it. Pastor Todd is really good at this, right? Okay, I'm not saying he's an irritant. What I'm saying is he's good at stirring us up. I love that about our pastor. And then our church goes out and does these acts of goodness and kindness and service and love for people. But here's the thing, folks. That verse isn't only for pastors. It's not like, hey, draw near to God, cling to his promises, and the pastors who are among you, get your people to do good things for others. It's for all of us. Let us work together. Let us work on each other and get ourselves doing good works. And I would say, folks, what if we all led by example in this? I, I think our church does a good job of it, but what if we did a great job of this, showing love and good works toward others? There's a story in, in my own life that the Lord keeps bringing my mind back to when I, I think about passages like this. And I'll close with this. Uh, before I moved out here to California, I lived in, in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, where I'm from. And I had the opportunity as a teacher, I was free on Sundays. And so I would go to different churches as they had needs and do pulpit supply. So if a pastor was on vacation, I would step in and preach for him while I was gone. Or if a church was without a pastor for a while, I would go in and preach there on a regular occasion. And so there's this little church in an old neighborhood in Pittsburgh who was without a pastor for about three years. And so just every other week I went down there and, and spoke for them. And I'd been doing that for several months. I would get down there about 20 minutes early just because I didn't want to run into traffic and be late. And I would park at the end of the block. There was no parking lot, just everyone parked on the street. And I would use that extra time I had to go over the message and prepare my heart. And so one Sunday morning, I drove down there, got there early, got parked, pulled out my notes, and was studying my message on kindness. When I old noticed a, uh, an older gentleman walking down the sidewalk, and what caught my attention was how slowly this guy was walking. And, and walking is really an overstatement because he was kind of shuffling, and shuffling is even a bit of an overstatement. He was moving so slow with each one of his steps that, no, no kidding, don't think badly of me, but I counted. It took him 36 steps to cross a square of sidewalk, okay? That's, that's how slowly he was going. And so I'm, I'm sitting here watching this guy, and I'm thinking of the neighborhood. I'm going, I don't know where he's going, but anywhere he's going is going to take him like the whole day to get there. And he was obviously very, very old. So I'm sitting there, and I'm studying my notes again on, on kindness. And I look at my watch, and I've got 20 minutes till I need to be in the service. And that's just, you know, when Sunday school lets out. So I, I, I get out of my car and I walk up to him and I said, sir, my name's Ken. I, I help out at this church down here at the end of the street and I, I couldn't help but notice you were going somewhere. I said, if you're going somewhere close by, I'm more than happy to give you a ride there. He goes, oh, 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 thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to Kogo's. I said, oh, it, it was a convenience store nearby. I said, well, yeah, I, I'm happy to take you there. I, I don't think I can bring you back because I'll run out of time, but I can at least get you there if you want to ride. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I, I'd, I'd like that very much. So I, I helped get him like off the sidewalk and around the side to my car. And just that took about five minutes, like getting him down, getting him around. Got him in there, drove over to, to Kogo's and talked with him on the way there. And his, his name was Lester, Lester Day. He'd lived in that neighborhood his entire life. Now he was in his early 80s and he just needed to pick up a, f a few little things. So I took him, I dropped him off there. I said, it was, it was really nice to meet you. He goes, oh, oh thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I left and went to the, the church service and didn't think much about it. Sure enough, two weeks later, I'm back down there to speak again, and there's Lester shuffling down the sidewalk. And so I looked, and it's, again, I had about 20 minutes. I said, Lester, remember me? I'm Ken. Oh, oh yeah, I, re I remember you. I said, hey, if you need a ride, if you're going to Coco's, I'm happy to give you a ride. Oh, oh I, I'd, I'd like that very much. So got him in the car, drove him to Coco's, dropped him off, said goodbye. And this happened probably two or three more times. And finally, the Lord just laid it on my heart. I said, Lester, you know, I actually speak at the, the church there at the end of the block. And I, and I, I'd be honored if, if you would ever like to join us for church. We would love to have you. Oh, I, I'd, I'd like that very much. And so sure enough, two weeks later, I'm down there, and there's Lester slowly creeping down the sidewalk. I said, Lester, are you going to Kogo's? He goes, no, 
no, no, I'm, I'm coming to church. So we actually drove him the block because that was faster than having him walk the block down there. And some of the, the men from the church helped me help him up the steps. And I stood next to him as, as we sang the songs and then I spoke. And uh, afterwards I said, Lester, I don't know if you have plans for lunch, but would you want to come home? My, my parents don't live far from here. You could have lunch with our family. He said, oh, oh, oh yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd like that very much. So I called my mom and just made sure it was okay with her and I took Lester home. We had lunch with, with my parents and I and then we watched the Steelers game. They probably won, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and then I loaded Lester back up in the car and, and drove him back to his house. And when I dropped him off at his house, he turned to me and he said something I'll never forget. He said, I, I, I want to thank you very much for today. This is the best day I've had in a long, long time. You know, folks, I, I don't tell you that story to pat myself on the back because, man, I, I miss it a whole lot more times than I get it. I tell you that story to say how easy it is to show the love of Christ. You don't have to travel to another continent. You don't have to give away thousands of dollars. There are people all around us who just need to see a little love, who just need some acts of kindness done with the heart of Jesus Christ for them. And it doesn't take a lot. We just have to get off the couch. We have to go out our door and do it. And again, Crossroads, in some ways we do this well, but in other ways we could do this so much better. And what would it be like in our valley if we were the church that weren't just affected internally by what Jesus Christ had done for us, but showed it every day through acts of love and service because of the love Jesus Christ has shown to us. 2020 is right around the corner. I don't want to be the same. I want to be changed because of the love of Christ. I want to draw near to Christ. I want to cling to his promises. And I want to go out and stir up love in all of us and in my own life, in my own family, in my own marriage to show other people the love of Jesus Christ because of all that he has done for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. Your life, your death, your resurrection have changed everything. And Lord, now because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we're no longer stuck on the outside looking in. We have free entrance into the throne room of God. Lord, we can come to you as we're doing right now with our prayers, with our fears, with our hurts. Lord, with our desires, our longings. Lord, you hear us and you care about us. And Lord, we can look at how you've been faithful in your promises and just trust and know that you will continue to be faithful in those things. And Lord, would you help us? Would you help us to love people? not just the people who it's convenient to love or the people who love us in return. Help us to love the unlovely. Help us to go out of our way. Help us to, to stop looking at ourselves and look at others and see their needs and their hurts and see how we can show them the love of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for your word. Would you help us each in our own way, in our own walk with you? Would you help us to be changed, to be more like you? We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to do right now what I asked the, the junior high class to do so many years ago. I want you to take a moment and think what needs to change? What needs to change? Maybe it's one of the three things we've talked about. Maybe it's something different that the Lord has laid on your heart. Maybe your heart's divided right now and there's something that's pulling you away from a, a, a true, sincere walk with God. What needs to change? Don't let this moment slip by 
Don't let 2020 go by and find yourself right back here a year from now having missed a year of opportunity that the Lord has given you. Take a moment, consider the change that needs to take place, and then we'll close. Until now, I've been self-consumed, seeking everything that's left me empty, feeling insecure, dirty instead of pure, like I've wanted to hide who I am and what I feel inside. But something has changed. I feel my life has been rearranged. A weight I didn't know I carried has been lifted. It feels like I'm seeing everything for the first time. I have a purpose. I've found hope and joy. I feel peace. A few days seeking his face changed everything. But you have the righteousness of Christ. So fight on in the context of your position in Christ. And if you are not firmly rooted in the gospel and have not learned to preach it to yourself every day, you will soon become discouraged and will slack off in your pursuit of holiness. And to say, Lord, I'm living for you. I'm not trying to keep up with them. And to focus on what's right instead of focusing on what's wrong, you can have peace. What a great word of exhortation we've heard this morning. Amen. Oh, I just want to encourage you, as Pastor Ken has, don't let this moment pass. It is a, a end of the season, end of the year. We begin a new year together. Uh, no doubt, you, you want to see God grow you beyond what you could ask or imagine in 2020. And uh, I just want to encourage you to, uh, before you leave, maybe turn to the person next to you and just say, this is what I want God to change in me. Would you pray for me? Uh, there will be some prayer counselors down here if there's something that you would like them to pray for you. Uh, prayer isn't just because uh, you're broken or something drastic has happened in your life. Prayer is saying, God, I've got access to you, and I'm going to take advantage of that. I, I want my brothers and sisters to pray with me and for me. So come and ask one of our prayer, prayer counselors to pray for you. Ask a, a friend or a just maybe someone that you're sitting next to that's a, a new brother or sister. This is what I want God to change in my life. Would you pray for me? Uh, don't miss that opportunity as we've heard uh, this morning. We want to remind you, as you saw the video, ladies, that our Pursuit Conference is coming up in a few months. Uh, 
by the end of, if you sign up before the end of 2019, it's $55. After the first of the year, it becomes $70. So take advantage of that out in the lobby or online. Uh, also, we have a, a prayer, a go partner that we pray for each month. The December spotlight is on the Palomatils, Tim and Julie Palomatil. They serve in South Asia. They work in a children's home, uh, serving those that are underserved kids and families in their community, as well as Tim serving, teaching in a Bible college and seminary. So we want to remember uh, and lift them up this morning before we leave. So why don't you stand and join me as we commit our morning this year to the Lord. Oh God, what a privilege we have to partner in the ministry of gospel mission. Oh, how the work of your son Jesus has changed everything. It's given us courage and confidence to draw near to you, to, to hold fast to your promises, to go out and be radical for the mission of the gospel. And we're so thankful that we get to partner with people like the Palomatils in, in South Asia. We just want to lift them up to you this morning. Lord, we pray for their safety. We pray for open doors for effective ministry. We pray for their courage and confidence in the gospel. We pray that there would be much spiritual fruit through their ministry. Yea, even revival, God, would you bring revival to South Asia? And it's what we want in our lives. We want you to renew our hearts. We want you to revive us. We want to look at this new year with fresh eyes to seek you, to be courageous and confident that through us, through this local church, you might do great deeds might make an eternal impact in the Santa Clarita Valley. And so, God, we just ask that you would do what is unthinkable to us, but only you can do. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Have a great new year. Stay faithful, Crossroads.